This morning we're continuing our sermon series on the congregation's strategic goals, which are extraordinary hospitality, inspiring worship, compassionate mission and service, dynamic faith development, and extravagant generosity. Now, I'm guessing you already feel like these are important goals because you agreed to them as a congregation. So that's certainly the first step. Everyone has to agree to the goals. Pastor Don Fitzky and I agreed to them when we, we met with the church leadership before we all said yes to each other. So that seems like an important second goal, that your pastors are on board. They are great goals, and you've done a good job of picking them out. So when, not if, when we are meeting all of these goals on a regular basis, when they become part of our hearts and our spirits and of who we are, people outside of these walls will know it. They will say these things about us. And I want you to know, I believe that that will happen. I, I dream about it, I wonder about it, but I believe that will happen. And you should too. Because believing in ourselves as God's people and knowing we can do all things through Him is a good third step, isn't it? And when you think about it, maybe we should put that trusting in God step first, right? Now I guess I should start out this morning by telling you a little bit about myself. But don't despair that we're headed off the rails for the sermon this morning. Because what I'm about to share with you has everything to do with extraordinary hospitality, which is our subject for the day. I was raised in a non-church-going family, going to vacation Bible school with neighbors here and there, but not much else. When I was about 13 years old, my best friend, Debbie Moore, invited me to church with her right here at Lancaster Church of the Brethren. Everyone was especially nice to me, and I felt so welcome, and there were donuts. <laughs> From Debbie's parents to the people who were serving donuts and coffee, everyone asked my name, everyone said hello as though I had been here for my life. The youth advisors, Don and Ruth Collier, welcomed me and made me feel at home in Sunday school. And some of the other youth were already from my high school and they were nice to me and so were the ones who were from other schools. I just felt like I belonged here from the first moment. When we got to the worship service, Debbie's grandparents, aunts and uncles, and her sister, they all made me feel like I belonged there too with them. I loved every minute of coming to church, but I was raised to be a good girl, and good girls do not invite themselves anywhere. So on the way home, I kept thinking, how am I going to get these people to ask me to come back to church? And when we pulled in the driveway, Debbie's dad said, anytime you want to come to church with us, you be in my driveway by 815. So I came to church every Sunday for the rest of high school with the Lord family. But listen, it wasn't just church they invited me into. In order to take somebody else's kid to church every week, you have to make them part of your family. No matter what the Lord family plans were on Sunday afternoon, they could be going out to dinner, they could be having a family reunion. They took me along. Rather than ask somebody's kid from the neighborhood not to come with them that particular Sunday, they brought me into their family and took me wherever they were going. They made me part of their family. And if that isn't extraordinary hospitality, what is? Debbie and Dawn's grandparents, Albert and Martha Lord, invited me to call them Oma and Opa. Her aunts and uncles became my aunts and uncles. Diana Lord made me lunch right along with your kids every Sunday through high school. Today's her birthday. If you see her around, wish her a happy birthday. Where is she? Hi, <laughs> Extraordinary hospitality doesn't stop with a polite hello to a stranger when they enter the church and a polite nod when you see them an hour or a week or so later. 
It's an extended, long-term welcome that includes sharing our lives, our time, our hearts, our home, and our food. You heard Josh read about what the early church in the book of Acts did. They shared everything. Nobody had a need that wasn't met, and I needed the Lohr family. My parents had recently divorced, and I was in need of the kind of family connections that they gave me and that this church family gave to me just because I walked through the doors. Well, eventually I went off to college, and I drifted away from the church for over 15 years. When I had a baby, I wanted to give him the one thing I felt my parents had liked giving me a church upbringing. But I didn't know where to go or what to do. Five minutes after I stood on the 11th floor of the Christ building where I worked and asked God, where should I take this kid to church? I ran into Debbie Lauren Buckwaller on the square. And she did not say, hello, how are you? How's your family? She said, oh, Misty, we need you at our church. <laughs> so I brought my two-year-old back here to the Lancaster Church of the Brethren in May of 1995. I was nervous, so I did what I always do when I'm nervous. I showed up early to kind of get the lay of the land and remember what the place was like. When I walked through these back doors over here of the sanctuary, who greeted me by name after an absence of almost 17 years, I bet you know? Calvin. Calvin, I know. <laughs> he gave me that great big smile of his as though I never left. And he said, you're Misty, aren't you? He walked me to the nursery where Wendy Young made me feel okay about leaving my toddler with her, with a stranger. Calvin waited for me and walked me back to find a seat in this giant sanctuary which was almost empty except for whoever was practicing the organ. I sat here by myself and marked the places where the hymns were in the hymnal and in the Bible, and then a lady came and said, you're in my pew. <laughs> I dutifully got up and moved. But I saw the humor in it, and I was thinking, your family's meeting you here after Sunday school, they don't know what you look like. <laughs> after the service, I picked my son up in the nursery, and try to leave quickly like a lot of church visitors do. I could hear the people in line waiting to greet the pastor. They were saying, who is that woman? Do you know who she is? Who's that kid? Where's her husband? And I was trying not to greet the man in the room. My son had other ideas. He had this piece of paper with crayon all over it, and he hit God on the right the bread basket with it, and said, what would I make? And Guy knelt down and him straight in the face and said, that's very nice, what else can you make? And my son said, I make poopy in the big boy body. <laughs> Guy never skipped a beat. He said, well, I hope you continue to do that. <laughs> Maybe today's message is an example of that proverbial preaching to the choir. 
But I'm guessing that some of the issues in the world, in the church at large, in our beloved Church of the Brethren, and possibly even in this church, have maybe dampened just a little bit the kind of welcoming attitude that was prevalent in the 70s and the 90s when I first came here. When this congregation extended the kind of hospitality that the book of Acts tells us about. Because some of the most beautiful words in the Bible to me, brothers and sisters, and I hope they are to you, come from this passage. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. There is no more important goal in the church than that for us, brothers and sisters. We have to be about being the people who set the example for others to find Jesus. And to do that, we need to be warm, welcoming, friendly, and unassuming. We need to look at what we're doing and say, not that all well, it ain't broke, we're not going to fix it. But yay, it's working. How can we do it just a little better? So today we're centering our thoughts on two things. First, the church isn't a club. It's a family. And in fact, it's a church family, which is even better than a biological family, because here everyone is welcome, and everyone's part of the in crowd. There's certainly no secret code, there's no secret handshake. And then second, there's also no entrance requirement, no hazing ritual. People don't have to meet a certain standard to be among us. We need, regarding the first point, that we're not a club, to behave as though Lancaster Church of the Brethren is a place where only long-term members understand what is going on. We need to not behave that way. We need to set things up so that visitors don't have to guess what we're doing. I love that you put the page numbers for the pew Bibles in the bulletin. Because I sat here many Sundays going, is that Joel before Obadiah or There are lots of things we can do like that. When new people come to Sunday school, do we help them find their way around the Bible? Or do they walk, we watch as they search in vain? I'm glad we don't make visitors stand up in the spotlight like some churches do. And I hope we're not putting people in a position of feeling like they need to dress a certain way or know a secret handshake in able to worship here in order to be able. One of the hardest parts of being new at church is not knowing the songs and not knowing your way around the Bible when everyone around you seems to know all the lyrics and all the books of the Bible in order whether they do or not. Those things can't be helped because we do know these things. But we can help them understand that we were all new once. Whether we were a child or 30 or 40 years old when we came to the church. As a church, we also need to work at not using acronyms that only we understand in the bulletin and the newsletter or on our website. There are lots of people within the church who don't even know that BHA stands for Brethren Housing Association. And NYC does not stand for New York City. It stands for National Youth Conference. And SCUBA stands for Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. Okay, I'm showing off a little bit. <laughs> but you get the point. We also need to guard against using in-group language that only we understand. But it's harder than it sounds to do these things, brothers and sisters, because we're so used to it. It all seems perfectly normal to us. So we need to go the extra mile and think about it. When you write something to submit for the bulletin or the newsletter, take an extra minute, read through it, and say to yourself, if I had never set foot in Lancaster Church in the Dark, would I understand what this means? For the record, I've been receiving our newsletter for years, thanks to Calvin, and I can see that we're already doing that very well. If you work with kids, try to think of new parents when you're working on Sunday school or youth group plans. The parents who haven't been here for years and years, who don't know what entrance to pick up their kids at or what time they need to be picked up. Just because we've done it that way every year doesn't mean the new people know. <coughs> I was the parent who had no idea where to bring the kid or that I was supposed to bring his lunch. 
He reminds me of that now that he's 27. It's easy to fall into the, well, everybody knows that kind of thinking. I'm no exception. We all go through life making certain assumptions, but in the church, we need to be doing our best to think about others and not make those assumptions or make them as infrequently as possible. We need to help new people to feel comfortable, not just about entering here, but also about what is going on here during worship, during Sunday school, during times of volunteering. We in the church office are going to be working actively at ways to do this in the bulletin and the worship services, but you can help too in every way that you are personally involved in the church. What would what I'm doing look like to a new person? Explain to someone nearby what they mean by that. If you hear some in-group talk during fellowship meal or during worship. Debbie's grandmother used to write notes on the bulletin to me to say, this is what that means, what he just said. That was so helpful to me as a young person. Now, I realize that not everyone has the gift of gab or the ability to approach a stranger that I have. If this is your gift, by all means, just suck up your scared, say hello and welcome, and mean it. If it isn't your gift, if you're an introvert or you're a little on the shy side, you can still have a smile and a welcoming heart. People can tell if you're snubbing them or if you're just the quiet type when you look at them. And if you refuse to look at them, that says something else too. If we all do what we can, God will make it work together for his good. We're all about what is God's best interests here. Do what you can, and God will bring it all together into a beautiful thing. You see, we need to be able to open not just our doors, but also our hearts to everyone who enters. Not just those who meet our standards of Christianity the minute they walk through our doors. Jesus has no entry requirements and no hazing rituals for coming to know him. He doesn't make us push pennies across the parking lot with our noses or eat an abundance of raw goldfish like some hazing rituals. Why do churches require people to sit up straight, act right, and live right to come seeking? Shouldn't this be the place where they come to find out what the big deal is? Shouldn't this be the place where they come to find out why most of us are happier than they are? A few years ago, I was working in the church office when an obviously drunk man walked in looking for directions to a place where he and his friend could find work. The man was literally staggering to keep from falling over. I was concerned that he was driving, but he assured me he wasn't. So I printed directions for him and his sober friend from my computer. The man was very grateful. He threw his arms around me and kissed me on the cheek, and of course I hugged him back. I said, remember that you can always find the help you need at a church. And he left. Later, when I thought about the incident, I prayed that he would remember my words someday, because I knew that someday he would need them. Remember, you can always find the help you need at a church. And now I pray that if he ever does remember that, it would be so true. That he would not wander into a church where the people would immediately chastise him, where they might say, we don't need your kind here, or where they might expect him to immediately begin behaving like them after his first Sunday of warming their pews. Do we do that? Do we welcome someone only if they're pretty much like us? Do we make them feel as if they have to accept every tenet of what we believe or they aren't welcome among us? Do we baptize someone and then expect them to immediately become perfect Christians and live like the saints who have been doing it for 50 years? I hope not. In the Church of the Brethren, we are pleased to say that one of our firm beliefs is freedom from force in religion. What does that mean to you? To me, it means we'll meet you where you are on the walk of your faith. If you're willing to start on the path with us by taking the big scary step of walking through the doors, we'll meet you where you're at 
and will help you along to an understanding of who Jesus is for us, who he can be for you, his life, his teachings, his death, and his resurrection, what they mean to us, and what they can mean to you if you will walk together with us as his family. We'll meet you right where you're at and hold your hand. We'll call you brother or sister and mean it. We'll be there for you when you hurt and when you feel joy. And we'll wash your feet when you're weary and lift you with laughter when you need it. And we will work beside you to help others to find the path we're on as well. We won't force every belief and hallowed idea that we have spent a long time coming to down their throats. Because there's room at the foot of the cross for all of us. And not one of us in this room is at the exact same spot on the path as another. Do we really believe in freedom from force and religion? I hope so. Because we need to be meeting the people that God sends to us at their starting point, wherever they are on their journey. We need to help them by gently guiding them as God calls us to do. Not as we would do if we were left to our own devices. People at this church did all this for me twice. Do you understand why this hospitality thing means so much to me? Pastor Jan Croucher says, it seems to me that hospitality is not only important, but it is essential for genuine spirituality. In an uncertain world where many receive only rebuke and rejection, our little, unspectacular acts of kindness and open generosity can make all the difference. And she goes on to say, that may just be the only sign of the love of Christ that another person experiences, ever. I wonder how it would be to face God someday and be reminded of those who drove away from him by being haughty, holier than thou, high-minded, or inhospitable. God sends us these people. He entrusts them to us. He wants us to help more people along his way. He wants us to live in a place, a church home, where we can say, day by day, the Lord adds to our number those who are being saved. Before I close this morning, I want to show you something that I got recently that is a perfect example of this. The week before Christmas, I moved my books and some other things into the church office here. My husband and Pastor Don did all the heavy lifting, but Tiffany's son Hugh was in the church office because he had off school. So he made this, you can't see it in the back, it says, Welcome, Love, Hugh. And there's a picture of a snow day on it. Hugh never met me before. And he doesn't even go to our church. But you know what Hugh understands? Hugh understands extraordinary hospitality. You see, Jesus says we're supposed to love first. Hugh makes art and signs it love. He's willing to begin his relationship with me with love. He's not going to sit around and wait to see if there's anything that's even remotely likable about me and maybe a year or two down he might love me. He's willing to begin his relationship with me with love and let the rest of it fall into place from there. Now, I don't think most of us grown-ups are wise enough to do that, to have the faith of a child. We tend to stand back and watch, see if maybe there'll be something likable about this stranger we've just met, and then maybe a few years down the road we'll love her. But Jesus says, love your neighbor. He says nothing about waiting to see if they're lovable. You get it. Children get it. Extraordinary hospitality comes down to this. Love everyone who comes in the door, and everything else will surely fall into place from there. That is God's plan. The writer of Hebrews says, let mutual love continue. 
Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, I'm not saying I'm an angel. I certainly am not. But what if the stranger you welcome into your midst is your future pastor? What if she walks in and sits down and the only person she meets is the person telling her she's sitting in the wrong pew? <laughs> what if this future pastor doesn't run into somebody like Calvin who makes him feel like it's a good thing that he came in here this morning? What if your future pastor came in here and left feeling like this is a cold and empty place? It's not just up to the official church greeters, brothers and sisters. All of us need to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers for the people. We need to devote ourselves to extraordinary hospitality so that all the sharing and caring and growing that happened for the church in Acts will happen for us. It's not about church numbers. Those are important to a lot of people. It's about our hearts exploding for each other and for the rest of God's people and how full of joy. 